Uh, I'm Sarah Horna, I'm the Director of Marketing and Business Development in this town, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to our neighborhood, to our show, and to our panel discussion today. Uh, I'll be extremely brief. Um, displaying art in a neighborhood like this has been a dream of mine for years, um, and so I'm pinching myself that I'm welcoming all of you here to this conversation, um, that I've welcomed so many of you to see the show in the last two months, and that there are so many of you at home watching. Um, I'll take a short moment to thank all of the owners who generously donated space to the show, um, and specifically to thank Global Holdings and 875 3rd Avenue who donated this incredible concourse um, to display so much art. Um, and so then I want to thank and introduce our partner in mounting this show, Barbara. Uh, Barbara from Art on the Ab is going to come up and introduce our curators in our panel. While she's making her way up, I'll say, um, none of this would be possible without her, without her incredible vision. So thank you, Barbara. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you who are here with us this evening. It's amazing to be in this wonderful gallery space surrounded by this incredible art. Uh, I enjoy coming and I come often, so thank you for being here. And thank you for anybody who's watching at home as well. Um, welcome everybody. I want to take a moment to also thank um, the East Midtown Partnership. Uh, without their support in all manners, we would not be here this evening and this intersections exhibition would not have happened. And I'd also like to thank our other partners, Chase Bank, um, for their continued support of community, of culture here in East Midtown and in New York in general. This is the first time we've live streamed anything, uh, which I think is testimony to the importance we are placing on this panel discussion. And thank you, Peg and Halima, for being here with us and for leading it. And thank you to Norma and Susan, who, have, who are our curators, Norma Kruger and uh, Susan Ely Davis. They have been 100% committed to Art on the Ave from day one. Um, they work tirelessly with um, coordinating artists, selecting art, curating, and now um, organizing this event for us. So thank you, ladies. Um, could not do this without you. And would you go further and introduce again um, our panel? This evening, and I want to thank everyone for being with us. Welcome, and thank you so much. We have a great evening planned for you. It's going to be very exciting and insightful. This is a rare topic, rarely discussed, and we have two of the best people to speak on it this evening. My name is Norma Krieger, and I'm Susan Davis Ely. We are the Art on the Avenue curators. So we'd like to say, in celebration. A Black History Month, Art on the Avenue is so pleased to present a conversation collecting African American art and the influence of African American art on the marketplace. Yes, it's, it's our great honor to welcome two titans and esteemed experts in the field of African American art for their participation this evening to provide awareness about the value of African American art and artists. At this time, I would like to introduce Peg Alston. In the nearly four decades since establishing Peg Alston Fine Arts, Peg has emerged as this country's foremost private dealer specializing in works by African American artists and other artists of African descent as well as select pieces of traditional African sculpture. Peg has sold works by some of the most outstanding 20th, 20th century black masters, including Aaron Douglas, Charles White, Augusta Savage, Elizabeth Catlett, and among others, numerous. Uh, she has also sold works by some of the leading names on the contemporary art scene, Sam Gilliam, Betty Saar, Howardina Pindell, 
in Faith Ringgold, who right now, you're probably aware, has a major retrospective at the new museum encompassing three floors. When Peg emerged on the New York art scene in the 1970s, it was a time in art where African American art was very limited. Early giants such as Romero Bearden and Norman Lewis generously served as informal men mentors during the beginning stages of her career. Over the years, she has played a pivotal role in cultivating an interest around the country for investing in African American fine art. She has been active with the Studio Museum in Harlem and many other major New York City cultural institutions. She was appointed to the Arts Committee, the New York State Council on the Arts, where she served the maximum term of three years. Currently, Peg is a member of the Association of Art Dealers, of Women Art Dealers, that's the important part, AWAD, of which Norma and I are also members. And Peg was selected by history makers for their archival collection of outstanding African Americans. I'd like to hand the microphone over to Norma so she can introduce Halima. Well, let's have a hand for Peg Alston for coming with us tonight. Thank you so much. And at this time, we would like to introduce Halima Taha. Halima Taha is an art professional whose curatorial, art advisory, gallery, appraisal, strategic planning, writing, and management services develop corporate, not-for-profit, academic, and civic program and audiences. She's best known for her groundbreaking bestseller, Collecting African American Art, Works on Paper and Canvas. It was the first book to validate collecting fine art printmaking and photography by Americans of African descent as valuable assets and commodities in the market. It was also used as a choice PBS membership incentive, raising three times its fundraising goal. In addition, her work provided the foundation in conjunction with the historic National Black Fine Art, 1997 to 2009, for cultivating educating the market that enabled Swan Galleries to successfully launch the first African-American auction category within an international arena since 2008. Her work was also the catalyst for major museums to pursue collections of African-American art for exhibition within the last 20 years worldwide. She's an arts advocate committed to nurturing the development documentation and acquisition of black visual culture. And she is a professional speaker, arts writer for Artnet, Black Art in America, Pigment Tribes, and Sugarcane Magazines. Let's have a hand for Halima Taha. Thank you for coming. Good evening. Good evening. It's always a pleasure to see new and familiar faces together in pursuit of increasing our knowledge about ourselves and the world in which we live through art. And uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to do before we begin this wonderful conversation. First, I want to, on behalf of Peg and myself, to thank again Norma Krager and Susan Davis um, Ely for inviting us to participate in this wonderful event here on Art on the Avenue, as well as Chase Bank and East Midtown Partnership. Thank you very much. Um, the other thing that I want to um, point out, which is very important to me, is that it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here with Peg because um, early on in my career, right after I got, a, a year after I graduated from college, she was one of three black women in New York City who were prof art professionals as art dealers. And she was a great inspiration and through her leadership, through example, um, she was a source of inspiration because at that time, um, most people who were interested in the arts, their, the track was to work at the Studio Museum as a curatorial assistant and then go from that to museums or pursuing academic study. 
And so um, I was the only person of my generation that was really engaged in the marketplace. And um, so, you know, my peers at that time who pursued the more traditional track, who have made extraordinary contributions to the field were Thelma Golden, who's now the director of the Studio Museum in Harlem. She was a curator and an institution builder. And of course, Dr. Kelly Jones, who's still a curator, she, and she also is an extraordinary scholar and MacArthur Fellow, and also a really good person, <laughs> which is important too in the field. Um, but those were my contemporaries, and I was in, you know, kind of out there, and Peg was um, one of um, the leaders in the field. Um, and so I just want to take this opportunity to, again, give you some audible flowers as a pioneer, because essentially as a pioneer starting in the 1970s, um, the market as we're aware of it now um, was not the same, which Peg will talk about. But I want to say that as a pioneer, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of commitment that she made to nurturing the artists and believing in them and placing them in corporate as well as private collections at a time when people were, were only um, looking at the work by, based on the color of the artist's skin. But she was able to present the work as meritorious work by quality artists, American artists, who were of African descent, but focused on the aesthetics. And she really um, has done quite a bit in the field. So I just wanted us to give her another <laughs> applause because it's like flowers for you, you know? So thank you. <laughs> so before we begin the conversation, I just would like, by a show of hands, how many visual artists are here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. So without any of you, there would be no art professionals. <laughs> and that's a fact. So I want to thank you for being the visual conscience of the world in which we live by expressing the hopes, dreams, um, and uh, successes and challenges in your work that invite people to discover new things about themselves as well as um, to explore ideas that they may never have without your work. So I want to thank you. And at this point, um, you know, our intention today is to have a, com a conversation about the evolution um, for the climate of black visual culture from the 1970s to the present. Um, and, you know, now we're dealing with the excitement of many people being interested in black visual culture in the market. But I think it's really important, and I know Peg feels it's really important, that people understand that it didn't happen overnight like many of the articles in the magazines and the newspapers are making it seem. And it didn't happen because um, blue chip, multi you know, multiple location galleries um, owned by Europeans of African descent found these artists. There's a history, there's a community, and a community within black visual culture that is a part of that collective activity between the artist, the dealers, the auction houses, the collectors, the critics, um, and the appraisers and the historians. So, Peg, to start the conversation, um, I would love for you to share about what it was like in the 1970s. I know you started selling African art, that was one of your passions, but what was the climate like in the 1970s? Well, you know, comparing um, those years with today, it's, it's like night, which was then, and day. Uh, the artist existed, but no one seemed to care, pay attention, uh, with the exception of Jacob Lawrence, Romare Bearden, uh, those were the pretty much the only artists that um, people were aware of. But there was not a market. There was not a market among um, anyone, African Americans, etc. Uh, certainly not not whites. The the galleries were not interested. Is that Susan? Hi there. <laughs> the and she knows very much about that uh, climate as well. Uh, Susan Stedman. 
whose uh, husband was an artist. But um, I came to art by way of being a babysitter when I uh, lived in the dormitory at NYU, undergrad. And it was my, my fortune to babysit for a woman who was very good friends, very good friends, with Sidney Janice. Sidney Janice was at that time, I guess, number one dealer uh, in New York. And at that point, New York was the center of uh, art. It used to be Paris, but in the 50s, I think, uh, early 50s, New York City was the center of the art world. Still is, you know, London might be moving closer. But uh, I looked all of this art, originals. I mean, prior to that, if someone asked me about art and uh, I would say museums, I never saw art in, um, you know, just an informal, personal setting. She had Jackson Pollock, Albers, Fernand Leger, and it was the art that I looked at. Somebody else may have taken the job. I mean, I worked on a regular basis, including in the summer going uh, with her to the Berkshires. Um, and this little baby, it turned out, was turned out to be Sidney Janice's child. Uh, and she has changed her name to Janice, as a matter of fact. But um, I remember saying when I got out of college, I wanted to have art in my apartment. And I didn't know, I don't think I could have named one black artist at that time. But, you know, I knew that they had to exist. And I saw the beauty of originals. My first work I purchased uh, when I graduated from NYU. I then went on to, um, to Columbia School of Social Work, but uh, Earl Miller, who happened to have been um, a member of Spiral. But it also looked easy. I said, well, gee, you know, maybe I can paint and put my work in a frame. I mean, this was abstract. You didn't have to draw or know know a form, etc. And uh, Earl Miller made it possible because I the first painting I purchased was from Earl, paid $60, <laughs> paid in on time too. But uh, he made it possible for me to come to his studio. He had paper, he had paints, etc. Because I had this drive, you know, gee, I could do the same thing. Well, I worked at it for five minutes, put down the brush, never to have picked it up again, because uh, I realized just it was far more to it than, uh, far more difficult than, than it looked. And I want to say for those artists who are here, I think, and I have told people, I feel that artists are the best of any and every generation. Those are the writers, the painters, the musicians. They are almost our moral compass. And um, many of the artists who were not being exhibited, they were painting no matter what. It was, or sculpting, it was their raison d'etre. It was, you know, they had to. Moving forward, I just felt that um, as I continued to buy what I could, pay on time, none of my friends or colleagues seemed to be interested, yet it, I felt that this was a very important part of our culture. I'm going to read something, I mean, I, in, I have to thank, and I didn't thank you before, Norma, Susan, Barbara, for making this possible, and also for creating and curating this, uh, this art uh, that we have around us. But uh, in 1977, and so I thank you because I went back into my records, 
did a little bit of research. There was a little uh, unique New York put out by Vi Higginson. Anybody know Guide to New York? So this was in 1977. And I was featured in the um, winter section. At the time, I had a show by Faith Ringgold. Her works at that time, these were soft mass uh, covered in cantacloth, selling for $100. But during the interview, and this is 1977, they quoted me as saying, I want, expect, and intend to put black art where it rightfully belongs. The next big thrust in the art world is coming from black artists. No question about it. Now is the time to collect. So that was the 19th. It was, we, we had a long way to go before we saw any of that. But it, it was just a strong um, belief. It was, you know, I mean, there was nothing to question. You know, we didn't have to wait for an art market to tell us who our artists were. Or that, or that the work was valuable, or the culture was valuable. Absolutely. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't about being validated by other people. We validated ourselves. And in addition to that, during this time, it's important to note that while many people were not paying attention to what you were saying or paying attention to the artists in the way they are now, um, a very important exhibition and publication in the 70s emerged, and that was Two Centuries of Black American Art, which was uh, uh, an exhibition curated and a publication written by um, David Driscoll. And the significance of that is that he was um, continuing um, a legacy of necessity and also educating people of his former professor, James Porter, whose 1943 master's thesis was um, Modern Negro Art. And that came about because of the fact that he wanted to know why the Harlem Renaissance artists were not being written about and acclaimed. And he was told that black people hadn't been in the United States long enough to have a history. So he wrote the first African American art history book and established what is now the field of African American art history. David Driscoll's book came out around this time that you're talking about and when this article was written and it traveled all over the world and the United States. And his premise was not only do we have a history, but we've had a history here for 200 years. Two years later, Dr. Samela Lewis published Art African American. Dr. Samela Lewis was the cornerstone to the field of African American art history because she was the first African-American and woman to have to earn a PhD in the United States in art history. So even though people were not purchasing work as they are now, um, these books emerged and many other collectors who were supporting the artists and, um, and, and some early scholars were beginning to expose themselves to documented history because, you know, the, the um, nature of the art world, you know, and, and particularly in the market, you have to, you have to document also. <laughs> they want you to not only present the work, <laughs> but they want history, bio, provenance, you know, who were the contemporaries. And, and prior to that, um, there were very, very few publications. And, um, and I will tell you that it was not until this century that you were seeing so many monographs and publications about African American artists and black visual culture. Um, as of the 1990s, there were still only seven major, five to seven major texts. So I just want to contextualize that as a backdrop to what you're saying in terms of the time frame um, and you championing these artists and you know and as you said these artists um, you know is the last vestige of American art that's been untapped and there's so much of it <laughs> right there's so much of it 
So from, from the 70s, you know, you usher into the 1980s. And that was a whole different kind of a climate. Ronald Reagan was president. There was a lot of money floating around. The material girl, <laughs> Madonna, and, um, and, uh, and there were a lot of different collectors. Um, I, my experience during that time, that's when I got involved, and it was a little different um, because I had was, became a co-owner of a gallery in Gramercy Park that was the first gallery to specifically market abstract works by African-American artists as the visual equivalent of the jazz idiom. And our client base were primarily Japanese and Europeans who were collecting German Expressionism. Um, and, but the gallery was set up also as an experiment to see um, you know, if it could sustain itself. Um, but it was a very different climate. Um, people, there was more disposable income among Americans of African descent, um, other collectors um, of European descent um, were filling the historic and aesthetic gaps, but mostly it was starting in the prints. Prints were very big in the 80s, weren't they? A lot of the prints and beard and... Well, it's those things, it's whatever people could afford. Right. And I think, you know, prints were made available because they were less... Right, it was a great way for many beginning collectors to start. And, um, but there, there were a lot of p painters that had not previously done prints um, among African American artists that were beginning to do a lot more prints during the 80s, um, you know, with Bob Blackburn and uh, Alan Edmonds. Um, and uh, what was the name of the guy in New Mexico? Um, Ron Adams. No, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, the, um, I forgot the name of the, 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 the press. This is what happens with time. <laughs> But, um, but, you know, during the 80s, what were your observations with, with regard to the market for you and contrast, contrasted to the 70s? Well, you know, I mean, number one, I realized that um, before there was to establish a market, you had to get people interested in art uh, because, you know, how can you buy if you don't know what's happening or what not very few people grew up around art I mean now it's quite different because the children of their parents who were buying art it's you know the the market just conti will continue to grow we will never go back to a period when there was zero interest in our artists and uh, that's certainly a good thing. So I would say that what I did in the 70s, 80s, maybe about 95% um, informing, educating, having art sessions uh, about art in order to get people interested. And, uh, and I used to, it, it, was, it was a growth maybe minimal steps, but it was always um, moving upward. Uh, certainly not the you know, explosion that we have today, but, and, and I, wanna make, I wanna make it clear that there's not really a distinction between European or earlier art versus, I don't even call it black art. It's art that happens to be created by blacks, period. You know, there's no other difference. Art is, I feel, universal, and I always felt that it should be, uh, but I had to stress black artists because nobody else was. And uh, I felt that it had some, it was our culture and that we needed to embrace our culture if nobody else did. Uh, in 1976, 77, Ed Clark asked to have a show. He knew I was trying to create a market uh, among blacks and apparently prior to that time, 
those who purchased his art were white. And, you know, he studied and would go back and forth to Paris. But he asked to have a show. He, he said, you know, because he's an abstract artist, he said, if blacks don't like my work, that's fine, but I would like to know. So um, it was his works then, pastels, we had a show of pastels, were $250. And we now? took down things. Now the same people who paid that amount, I have been able to sell for 150000 But uh, what we did is take down things that sold at that opening and had another reception the, uh, the following weekend. Um, so it, it's been the education. Uh, I don't just buy works by black artists, I buy what I like. So this is what I have tried to get people to focus on. Not the artists, but what appeals to you. Only you know that. It's not like a dress shop and saying, oh, that color looks great, it appeals to you, it fits you well. No. Um, and art is not a one-size-fits-all. This is where the viewer plays a major role because the art, when the artist completes something, it's then a part of the public and it's how it appeals to you. So I really stressed with people to buy what they enjoyed what they liked. A lot of people I realized were a little shy because I didn't take, they said I didn't take art, I should know about art, what is the artist trying to say in an abstract work, they're trying to find image when no image exists. Uh, so there's been a, you know, I have just been focusing on people getting what they enjoy and only once they take something home that they get because they like it. What I have done in the past is to have works and artists that I felt were painting from their soul. Not artists who were painting to please the public, not the commercial artists. And uh, some often I would have shows nothing would sell. You know, I don't then say that the artist is not good. Stanley Whitney is a very good example. I showed him in nineteen in the nineteen eighties. I had two shows. I think one thing sold. And uh, but I loved his work, and that's what I go. I went by what. I liked. It's hard for me to sell something that I don't like. Now there's a waiting list for, yeah. for Stanley Whitney you know, Peg, in I mean, Europe and in New York. Yeah. I just want to say your approach in terms of educating people and talking about what they like because it's always important to purchase what you like. But it's, it's important also historically because the reason why people of all ethnic backgrounds had a little skepticism about taking artists of African descent's work seriously has a lot to do with the history in this country that's justified and substantiated enslaving people of African descent. In order to justify it, they had to be, they were, they were said that they were unintelligent. So they don't have brains. They're only good for labor. They're only good for breeding. So how could these people create fine art, which is fundamentally about ideas, that artists are um, visual ideas, but then there's a whole emotion and then, of course, their whole personal history or background. And as you said, you know, to look at the, you know, the, the artists for being um, creatives as artists, um, their nationality and their ethnicity plays into part maybe about some of the iconography or some of the uh, narratives that they are expressing. But all, student, all artists that actually are trained formally are all learning world art history 
American art history, you know, um, the history of aesthetics and, and all of that. And even the artists that are self-taught, they're, they're clearly exposed to all of these things. But, it was, but that was a very effective way to engage diverse audiences of clients because you've worked with all sorts of people all over the world and to get them to focus on what they like and to engage in that. But it's important to know why it was so difficult since the, you know, since the 19th century, through the Harlem Renaissance, up through the, 50, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, because of this perception of being less than, perception of not having the intelligence, or even coming from a valid culture. You know, that was all a part of um, colonialism. And, in, and, um, and so I think that that's something that a lot of these publications that are talking about African-American art, the black art market, and all of this stuff, they're not really looking at why. It's not like it's just boom, overnight. They're, you know, they're, they're, the artists have been advocating for themselves. People like Peg and other art professionals and writers and curators you know, have been supporting these artists. And you know, the, you, you, know, you talk about it, a lot of the 80s was educating. I mean, I, I remember um, having to also spend t tons of time. And, and it was also frustrating, too. Um, people were buying art, and it, ha it was more for decorative purposes, too. Um, it, is it going to match the couch or the rug? And that's when I said, I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. Because, <laughs> because you know, you would get things that they wanted, and you'd find something really extraordinary. And, you know, and that's the other thing. A lot of times, collectors don't understand what is going on. It looks very easy. You know, we're friendly, we're nice, we're helpful, we're resourceful. But meanwhile, Peg and other art professionals are doing research, contacting people, doing, trying to get you the best, number one, of what you want. <laughs> And then when you find the best, it's, it becomes an issue of a couch or a rug, which is going to be replaced in five or ten years. So, well, you know, one of the things that I would tell people if, you know, art was going up and artists were, were, I would call them three years later and say, you know, the piece that you purchased and paid X number of dollars for, uh, you know, it's now selling for so right. much more. They said, well, that's nice to know, but I'm not selling it. Right. because they had that attachment to it. Um, I've always tried to, and I still, art as enjoyment. You know, when uh, people talk about and they name this artist and that, it's, it's, it's really another form of enjoyment. I mean, blacks couldn't come, even, you know, years ago, and still a lot of people are unable to afford uh, Art, I mean, you know, it's enough to put a roof over your head and feed your family. When I think about artists from the WPA period and earlier who were excellent, who had to give up, uh, you know, their craft and what they enjoyed in order to take care of their family, uh, it's, it's, you know, it just brings tears to my eyes because so much talent was lost. Um, but we will, as I said, never go back, to, we'll never return to a, peer, a period where uh, there's no interest in art. It's a part of our lives now, and now we have to get to whether or not we can afford what is out there. And, uh, yeah. 30 yeah. years ago, there were things that were, you know, like I mentioned, Ed Clark, uh, $250. One of the things that I remember, there was a, a dealer named Serge Sabarsky. He specialized in um, uh, German and Austrian art, and Ronald Lauder uh, was his client, and then they joined together to form a museum called the Neue Gallery, which is on 55th Avenue and 86th Street. And it's, it's a must see. But uh, Serge uh, died before the gallery was completed. He, was, he died before uh, the museum opened. 
but I attended a series of lectures. I didn't know who he was, but he was, uh, I learned, was uh, Ronald Lauder's later on um, art dealer. He said that you should buy what you can least afford. Meaning, let's say you have $5,000 and you want to, you have set it aside for work. Uh, you see something that's $8,000. Should you compromise and stick with the 5000 or do you, you know, you make that, uh, you know, just go further uh, and buy what appeals to you? He says yes, I say yes make the sacrifice to buy what uh, you enjoy. Nobody knows why you like it or what, and you don't have to figure it out. You know, like, what price do we put at what gives us pleasure? What price is that? You know, something that you like. We know being around negativity, what price that has, on our body and emotionally, but we never think about the other side and something that gives us pleasure. I mean, when I'm at home and I'm, somebody's visiting, I'm talking with them, but behind them on the wall is a painting that I have there because I love. I'm taking that in at the same time that I'm entertaining that person. And that, that pleasure, we, you know, we can't measure that. But I think it's very, very positive. I do too. I think, I think it is. Um, and I think for people who are starting collecting, they should also know that, you know, if you are working with an art professional or, or um, you know, a broker or a dealer, um, that if you see something that you like and you know it's, it's a little bit beyond the budget, and you make a deposit and you keep the agreement, you know, a payment plan for some people who are starting in their collections, you have to keep the agreement because they're not charging you interest for holding the piece until you pay it off. And it's out of respect for them and also the artist. But, um, you know, so for people who are starting, that's important. Um, and, but you should always, as Peg says, and I agree, to always buy what you like and, um, and feel comfortable with what you like. Don't worry about what other people are saying. It's your collection. Your collection is as unique as your individual fingerprint. Right. I think, you know, to move on to the 90s, you know, coming out of the 80s, um, you know, the 90s, um, there were um, more and more um, solo exhibitions and, but, you know, sprinkled around the country um, of African-American artists that were included in certain shows. Um, it was in the 90s that um, I began the process of writing, collecting African-American artworks on paper and canvas, and it took eight years to find a publisher for it because, um, consistent with what I said earlier about the perception or lack of perception of value of um, artists of African descent, all the major publishers said to me, and consistently for eight years, black people don't read, they don't buy art, and white people don't buy art by black people. This is in the 90s. Um, and the book was released in 1998. The year before, Josh Wainwright, Jocelyn Wainwright um, started the National Black Fine Art Show, which was an extraordinarily wonderful event, especially for art dealers and art professionals, because annually there was this big fair, dealers from all over the country, focusing on artists from uh, throughout the African diaspora, but mostly of African-American artists. Um, and under one roof, you had an opportunity to see regional and national and international artists. And it was an exciting time you know, for professionals and collectors and students and all sorts of people to walk through there. And early on, all of the publications would start out with a negative review. They just didn't want to see it. They just didn't want it to exist. Meanwhile, the shows were selling out, and people were doing well. And it was contrary to the, the, um, 
the perception of a lot of the critics because they were basing a lot of their thinking not solely on aesthetics. Not, you know, they were focusing on the fact that it was called the National Black Art Show. But it had to be created because many of these artists were not being included in the art fairs at the Armory. <laughs> and the art fairs that go on today are, you know, didn't exist at that time. The ecosystem hadn't shifted. Um, so what I'm saying is that going through, towards the, throughout the 90s into the beginning of the 21st century, um, there was a lot of activity among not only African Americans who were collecting, but, but Europeans, uh, European Americans, people from Asia, you know, all sorts of people, Latin America, the Caribbean, all sorts of people who had um, disposable income and they had bought their homes and they'd gone on their vacations and they had their stocks and their bonds and their jewelry and whatever else, they were buying art. So coming into this 21st century, a lot has happened in these first um, 20 years that have um, contributed to, um, you know, have contributed to the market. And, and I want to sort of mention specific things so that we can really talk about where we are today, because I know that's part of what um, people really want to understand, like why, how did this happen? So there are certain variables that have made the market explode. Uh, first one is that people who have been promoting and uh, selling the works and nurturing the artists for decades before, you know, since let's say the middle, we'll just start from the middle of the 20th century. It happened before, but from the middle of the 20th century to the end of the 20th century. Um, but what's going on, what's happened, um, that what's really had the impact are the curatorial themes in museums. Um, What's going on in Africa? What's going on in Europe? What's happening in the United States? What globalism is? What um, transnationalism is? The impact of the internet? These variables, in addition to people wanting to fill the historic and aesthetic gaps in their American art collections. So, you know, Peg will tell you that if, all right, if you like, you know, Helen Frankenthaler and, and uh, 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 Jackson Pollock, you have to have a Norman Lewis and you have to have a Mary Lovelace O'Neill because they are part of the linear aesthetic pedigree within the art historical canon. Those are their contemporaries, you know, aesthetically. And she has told clients that and, and she fills, she, you know, when she works with people, she fills those gaps for them who are interested in really putting together solid American art collections of American artists, but filling those gaps. But um, with regard to these other variables I mentioned, um, what's happening in Africa is that African cities are expanding and their focus on urbanity, democracy, and political stability has created many, many new museums. Temporary platforms have been created and galleries are flourishing in South Africa, Nigeria, Morocco, Ghana, Senegal. And, um, and then other variables include a sense of freedom of expression. Creative economics are expanding. Decolonization and educated exiles are returning home with economic prosperity. And there's a rise of a middle class um, that's collecting. In Europe, what's happening, which, and these, things, these variables are affecting the market for black visual culture worldwide. In Europe, Europe is confronting the colonial history through African art and dealing with their guilt, right-wing politics, and the crisis with ethnographic collections. And in the United States, we have the Black Lives Matter movement, um, woke culture, a rise of renewed black consciousness. There's a crisis in museology to diversify collections and staff. Um, we have right-wing politics as well. The accessioning um, of white male masterworks to try to purchase these other artists um, um, to fill these aesthetic and historic gaps. And then we have these global shifts that are affecting us, the market. There's the, the impact with the fixation with contemporary art by museums in the market and a rise of the creative economy and art asset class. That's a class now, um, creative economy and art as an asset class. 
Um, the result of this is a heightened interest in contemporary art at auctions. And 19th, and cent 19th century and old masterworks, you know, they represent now a much smaller segment of the market. And the way that globalism reflects the transnationalism of the explosion of these biennales and art fairs that are being used to market cities, um, it's a strategy that's actually um, to address economic and political issues. Globalization has increased travel um, for work. It's exposed people to cultures other than their own. Um, and, it's, and the art is linked to the B&L boom that occurred in the late 80s, but it wasn't as many um, you know, as it started to develop in the 90s. And now, um, you know, it's, they're, it's all over, they're, they're all over the place and they're continuing to build cities around these art fairs. Um, but what it has done is it's created a sense of borderlessness. And then transnationalism, you know, that's a result of people leaving their countries of origin and settling and working between multiple cities. And people are developing multiple identities, which again, a lot of the curatorial themes are revolving around identity politics. So now you have multiple identities, allegiances, knowledge and connectedness in, to different countries and cities. So the globalization of art is automatically demanding artists to become transnational beings. And this becomes the substance of their work. And at times, it challenges the idea of monolithic identities, which are a result of historical prejudice. And then finally, the internet, you know, is the social media platforms, um, they make exposure to art possible without having to travel. Um, and it's, it, and because it's visually driven. And it spreads ideas about social and political movements that implode or advance racism or feminism or LGBTQIA rights and all the connected ideas um, that impact collecting and art making. And um, so, you know, with all of that happening all over the world, um, the curatorial themes that are resonating with collectors all over the world um, by people um, of African descent include identity um, and fashioning new subjectivities. Um, colonial legacies are a part of some of the art. Social issues, geography, um, space and place, um, uh, black consciousness, uh, post-independence, democracy, um, attaining freedom from the strictures of class, gender and racism, and history and art specific subjects and, and aesthetic movements. All of this <laughs> is, these variables are the real reasons behind why the market is being drawn towards black visual culture. Also because of the substance, you know, and it is, did, the, the substance of it, <laughs> I mean, the same people who created America's classical music that's been exported worldwide, jazz, makes the visual equivalent of it. You know, is this is, you know and, and the culinary arts in this country, you know, it all is, is derivative of at black culture. In, in, and, um, and there's so many different f fusion of ideas. So these variables have contributed to um, why people who might not have ever collected works by American artists of African descent are looking at the work. And there, 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 there was a panel um, a couple of years ago, and um, one of the people on the panel um, it was a former museum director, and all of his people were saying, why didn't you tell us about these artists, you know? And, and he said, well, you know, um, he couldn't say I didn't know about it, but he, he, he wanted to just dismiss the fact that we shouldn't just be looking at all black shows, you know, um, of, of artists and everything, which was always a debate among artists as well. Um, but they had debates about whether they should have all women shows. And the thing is, artists should be seen in all contexts. They, you know, if they're just with women, there's a different dialogue. In this, if it's, it's just people of their religious background or cultural background or putting together groups of people, it depends what the curatorial theme is, is the point. <laughs> and, um, but it was very interesting because he was so dismissive of it. 
Um, and now people that, you know, relied on him for their guidance are mad at him because for, from his point of view, these artists didn't have any value 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And now he's advocating how important it is. And many dealers, and I will say this, and Peg knows this, there wasn't a Chelsea, <laughs> you know. It was, the, what, it was Soho, and it was 57th Street. And many of the artists, and I know several of them that Peg has worked with, would go to those galleries with their work to, to see someone or set up an appointment. And when they walked in, the receptionist or the dealer would say, oh, we don't show black art. And this is why we don't like to call it black art, because they were looking at just the color of these artists' skin. They were not looking at the, at the artwork to see what the ideas were about. And at the same time, you know, which is different now and then, in the 80s, you wouldn't go into galleries and see anybody that looked like me or Peg greeting you at the gallery. That just was not happening. Now we have, you go in the galleries and there's nothing but people of color, you know, at their front desk studying. <laughs> I didn't feel welcome at the Metropolitan Museum right. in the 60s. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, the attitude was, what are you doing here? It was very, very cold atmosphere compared to now where it's, it's just a happening. Yeah. You know, I even tell young people, you know, take a date, go to, on a Friday night, Saturday night, go to the museum. There's music, you can get something to drink. But in, in, the, in the 60s, uh, I felt, you know, like I shouldn't be long. They made me feel that way. Yeah, and in the, in the 1980s, that's when the Metropolitan Museum of Art made an uh, aggressive effort to start to increase their audience development beyond the, um, the traditionally elitist circles that would be their guests. And they started to, you know, the whole, I think it was the blockbusters that were starting to bring all sorts of people to the museums and, um, and trying to make the work much more accessible. And that is a, another factor that cannot be ignored of how museums started to focus on audience development beyond a certain elite group of people so that more students and more individuals could go on nights where, you know, there was no fee to get in, it was free, or, or there were special events, and then they started to hire people to try to bring different people in the community, because prior to that, there was the assumption that all people of color, of all ethnic backgrounds, um, were poor, had no money, you know? <laughs> and that, you know, and that was not necessarily the case, but that was the assumption, just based on history. Um, and I think that the other thing that's a driving factor for the market now, you have to also look at the corporate focus on uh, diversity, inclusion, equity, and access. You know, these are the four buzzwords um, in corporate America and within a lot of the museums. One of the reasons why the museums are buying so much work trying to fill the historic and aesthetic gaps in their American art collections is because they can become obsolete if they don't have brown and black people in those museums. Let's get real about this. You know, nobody wants to talk about this fact because people want to see not only themselves figuratively, but they want to see ideas from, from people that come from the same kind of substantive culture, rich cultural traditions and heritage that is reflective of, um, you know, the fact that, you know, all of us bleed red and we're probably, we are most definitely all related, you know, so, you know, anybody that thinks that they're all this or that, there's few people that are all one thing <laughs> culturally, they're finding that out, right? But the works by most Americans of African descent reflect aesthetic um, sensibilities that are from North, South, Central America, the Caribbean, Europe, Asia. You know, they're, it's an, they're looking at all of this. They're influenced by all of these things. And then they have their own perspective in how they express it. But these museums, they, that's part of the scramble. Um, and also the corporations um, 
I have to say that in some ways they, they, um, they, they really um, were responsible coming into the 21st century for developing um, the concepts of um, diversity, ex developing the concepts of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Because in 19, I remember December 1999, I was looking at all of these business magazines, and all of them on the cover talked about how the corporate thrust and focus for the 21st century was going to be the Latinx community, women, black people, and the LGBT community. The, the QIA did not exist in 1999 as a consciousness as it does now. But those were their target markets for their goods and services. And in order to target them, they had to have people in those corporations moving laterally instead of the traditional pyramid but what I will credit the corporate um, culture for doing is that because of business, they were embracing the spirit of diversity more so than academia. For academia, diversity and affirmative action was a legal consideration and concern, but the spirit was not necessarily reflected in the hiring practices or even the curriculum for that matter. But in the corp within the corporate infrastructure, um, because of the um, profit goals, um, they had to develop language, consciousness, and um, awareness within their companies. And that is also tied to the marketplace now as well. So those are, you know, so, you know, as Peg has described from the 70s and the 80s and then coming through the 90s and the National Black Fine Art Show was a big thing. People all over the country. Yeah, that was a thrust. That was very, very it was this, and you know, nobody talks about it. But Josh Wainwright had a vision, and he had a hard time getting that show up and keeping it going. But people came; it, uh, it was up for like eight years. People came from all over the country. It was an event. You went to New York. The when was it? in February? Yeah. yeah. You went to New York. That's when you came to to New York, and then you went to see all of the shows, and then. You know, Swan. Black History Month. Yeah, this was yeah. It was right before Black History Month. Super Bowl. It was Super Bowl weekend at one point. <laughs> That's right. It was Super Bowl weekend. Um, but and then at that time, you know, Swan Gallery, um, they were over a period of time beginning to see that there was an interest in African American artists' work in paintings. They had a lot of book sales and poster sales, and a lot of people who owned paintings were going to the to Swan, but they weren't handling any of that. So they started to educate themselves and come to the National Black Fine Art Show because they had no real knowledge about it. It was the National Black Fine Art Show that taught Swan about African American art history and about these artists. This is a fact. This is history. This is the fact. This is not what white people want to talk about, you know, and this is one of the challenges about, you know, I always say Instagram. <laughs> Instagram is the epitome of Descartes cogito, I think therefore I am. So you could say you are whatever you want to be on Instagram, there's no vetting, and there's no one to bear witness to it to being true or not, right? But the fact is, is that from the National Black Fine Art Show and the programs and conversations with dealers that were there, um, Swan realized that there was a viable market. And, and so they set up their first auction. And it was a good business decision, but it also hurt the National Black Fine Art Show because they decided to open that fair, their auction. Of course, from a business perspective, people are coming from all over the country. But people would hold their money to, to buy at the auction um, before they would come to the fair. So it had a, an adverse impact on the fair and um, for a, a fair that established that market. And this needs to be said and stated. This is history that cannot be erased and shouldn't be erased. Should there be questions now? Yes. We'll take some questions. Good evening. Uh, uh, my name is Sage Gallant. First of all, thank you both very much. This was 
incredibly informative. I, I can have a million questions. Um, so I appreciate you both being here and for your perspective. No, it's my pleasure. Actually, I just worked 12 hours and I, I'm one of the artists showing here um, at uh, Art on the App and I'm grateful that I came or would have dressed better otherwise. Um, You're beautiful. You're fine. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Oh, uh, the mask there, that's one of my pieces. And then, um, thank you. The two over there, there's a blue one and the uh, colored one with a female print on it. Those are my three pieces here. And thank you, Barbara, Susanna, and the first one for allowing me to be here. Oh my God, there's so many questions I have in my head. But the principal one is, is art. Vincent Van Gogh sold, I think, one painting in the course of his life. He was considered a hack, a nobody, a non-artist in his day. Um, what makes an artist valuable outside of the artist's need to paint, to create? You mean the artist as a person or the piece of art the that the artist made? The work. The work and the person is there's very yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> We're going to have two different answers. You want to start or do you want me to start it? Because we will have two different answers and they're both important. Right. Um, you know, it's just like dancers, musicians, you know, some make it because they happen to be at the right place at the right time. Uh, it's the same for an artist. I think we have as many wonderful artists out here as there are artists who are represented. And sometimes the artists, many of the artists who are represented are not so great. <laughs> I, I want to say that. That's true. <laughs> but um, it's, it's the exposure for the most part. And um, even museums don't get to know artists until they are introduced to the world by a gallery. You know, a gallery will have to represent that artist and it just moves on uh, in that way. It's, um, and it's not a fair way of doing things, but that is the situ that's the situation. Uh, it's exposure, even like the, many of the African American artists who are represented by galleries who have galleries in places in addition to New York, that you know, really increases the knowledge, the recognition, and the market. Uh, I don't think it's an accident, for instance, Romare Bearden, Jacob Lawrence, in Europe, they don't know about those two artists, whereas I call Bearden like the, you know, the Picasso of the 20th century African-American artists. But there were not galleries at that time who were showing on the international level. So you can take it from there. So there, in terms of value, perception of value is a relative thing. And I think as an artist, I want to tell you that, yes, what you do is valuable. And you have to always hold on to that truth for yourself and not allow the opinions and of other people to dissuade you from your vision. You are fortunate, though, to be in the 21st century as a visual artist because of the way that the internet and other technology is, is um, available um, to help you navigate the formerly traditional infrastructure of the art world where it's about the relationship with the artist with the dealer and then the dealer is working with critics and collectors and curators to help promote the artist. Um, however, um, what is also happening is that a lot of artists are using social media as a way of exposing their work, but artists like you would need to start to talk about your work within the context of art history. Who are your contemporaries and what is the linear aesthetic pedigree of your aesthetic? So that writers 
and other collectors can make certain historic connections to your aesthetic. So if you are moved by Van Gogh, let's, I don't know, you know, like if your work, you know, is moved by Van Gogh and there are other kinds of impasto kind of painters and encaustic painters, then you want to talk about your work within that context. One of the things that's not happening with a lot of younger painters now, and I think, I don't know if you've noticed this, they're not visiting each other's studios and talking about art anymore because they're afraid someone's going to take a picture, post it on Instagram, and then they get, somebody else is going to get credit. And my feeling is, what, you have one idea? What's wrong with you? You know? <laughs> You know, but what's important and a concern is that is there going, are there going to be any other art movements? Because the art movements come about from artists coming together and discussing aesthetics and a, and a certain problem, um, like Romery Bearden did with the Spiral Group, and he introduced the black and white collage with the newspapers. They weren't interested in it, and he developed it. You know, so for you, in terms of value, that's the traditional infrastructure is one thing. But what's opened up to artists now is a non-traditional structure to get their work out there. And there is, a, you know, in the traditional infrastructure, there is politics, you know. Whenever you have three people, it's a political situation. So you have to go out and meet people, but you also have to understand the timing of, of it and have all of your, your stuff together. Have your artist statement really clean, you know. Um, um, have your, um, you know, your images together, work with someone to help make it clear, put your stuff in an art historical context because that's what curators want to understand so, um, you know, so that they can make a connection. You know, it's like gumbo, it's all these ingredients. <laughs> in addition uh, for, I mean, I don't, you know, artists, uh, we look for artists who develop a language of their own. I mean, it's okay to be influenced by other artists, but then you have to take it to a level where it's your print, your language, you know. I mean, I don't um, just artists who have already established themselves, but I do look for artists who have a theme and have developed something that is uniquely theirs. Uh, if, you, if I see something where this looks like one artist and there's another style and there are about 20 separate styles, I realize that that artist hasn't arrived at developing something that is their own unique uh, print. That's I call it a language. Yeah. That's a, that's a really important point. Yeah, you have to push the medium. Push the medium that you're working in and, um, and, uh, and you know, and, the, and people will validate it. I mean, I think, you know, they'll validate it by purchasing it. They'll validate it by talking to you about it. But um, you have to lead by your own example, too. And don't try to satisfy the public. Norman Lewis, for instance, Every, you satisfy yourself first. Forget about, you know, the outside market. Whether or not they're going to like it, you have to like it. Welcome. Any other questions? Uh, again, ladies, I really want to thank you. It was an extraordinary talk. Like everybody, you can do 20 sessions of this. All right, you're just scratching the iceberg. Um, my name is Chris Lee. I'm an artist. I'm 60 years old. I grew up in New York City. Um, uh, I got a scholarship uh, in 1972 to Dalton Schools, uh, prep school, the, the whole thing. At the time, as a young artist, I mean, again, you had the sort of white Western canon drilled into you. Um, you didn't see anybody like you. You know. You, I came of age in the 80s, I went to Rhode Island School of Design, and at that time, Basquiat was blowing up, and the Lower East Side was very attractive, and it seemed, uh, it seemed uh, like a good thing and a bad thing. The bad thing is that it seemed to a young mind like me that um, it was very easy. You know, Basquiat was very easy, an excellent work ethic and all that kind of stuff, but after all of a sudden done, it kind of is deceptively easy, shovel and all that kind of stuff. I was a contemporary of Thelma Goldman. She was at Smith when I was at Rhode Island School of Design. She did the hard yards, just like you did. 
of uh, creating the market that we have today. You know what I mean? And I guess my question is sort of like, I'm 60, what do you have to say? No, it didn't happen overnight. But you do have to say uh, it did accelerate significantly in the 80s and the 90s. So there's a big gap between Basquiat and Thelma. Basquiat was one at a time. Thelma nurtured a lot of voices and a lot more comprehensive than you did. Uh, you guys created a much more comprehensive, deep field. So what do you think of that period from the 80s and the 90s when the, when the art, the cultural scene accelerated so much for uh, visual arts? Well, you know, I feel that the, uh, as Halima mentioned, uh, and I want to stress, the uh, fine, the black, what was it called? The fine, the black fine art show. Yeah, the National Black Fine Art yes. Show. Yes, um, was, I, th I think, the beginning where uh, even dealers saw that there was a market among blacks, that blacks were interested in art. And even a lot of whites started renting booths and selling works by black artists. Uh, and I, I think that that, is, that that was really a thrust that we hadn't seen before. David Driscoll did uh, bring in and stress uh, 200 years of I think at that time he called it black artists. Yeah. It wasn't African American, but, it was but uh, as a matter of fact, he has an, had an apartment in my building. Yeah. As a matter yes, of fact, yes. <laughs> but uh, that was back in the '70s or mid '70s, uh, and nothing happened. But at least he let the world know. I mean, I brought my mother, and she said, "Gee, I didn't know that there were so many black artists." But um, it was the national, I think, on the, you know, for the first time, people realized that there was a growing market among blacks and that they were interested in works by black artists. Yeah. I think there's a very important thing that has to be distinguished here. The difference between curators and their role on the market is, is very different than art professionals role in the market. And the market thrust for putting these works by artists in collections primarily was not coming from curators. So I think that's a very important distinction. However, curators at museums do purchase work. But, and curators are important to um, helping the art professionals by curating exhibitions, by exposing different artists, many of whom art dealers are working with. But we're talking about the art market and the art world, different things. The art market is the artist and the art dealers and the collectors and the auction houses, okay, and the fairs. Part of that art market is within the greater art world, which includes the curators and the historians and the appraisers and the critics. And a lot of time, and, and I think that when it, you know, um, I think that this is very important. We can't discount also the, the um, scholars. The scholarship has also impacted the marketplace because people now have historical context. And, but the curators, we're not spending as much time educating as much as fundraising for their exhibitions or their museums and getting collectors to buy the work from PEG or other dealers to donate to the museums. And, I, and, and, it, and I'm not discounting anything by anyone because we're all cogs in this big wheel. And I think that that's a very important thing that also isn't really addressed. It's not one person or one institution that has contributed to the success of black visual culture as we see it now in the media and the press. And historically, you know, um, the press likes to pick one person. It's like when Jackie Robinson was, you know, he's gonna speak for all black people. Really? You know? <laughs> 
in history, you had all of that, you know. It, you know, and and one curator doesn't speak for all the artists or all the collectors, but that one curator that you're talking about has made a significant, significant contribution to the field, um, you know, and is very smart at what she does, you know, and you know, so kudos to her. But it's important to understand that. You know, if there wasn't someone, you know, Linda Good Bryant, a contemporary, June Kelly was the first black woman who was a member of the Art Dealers Association. You know, I mean, um, you know, you have other dealers that have been out here educating and educating the very collectors that decided to get a museum membership and get on those committees. So it's, I think it's important, but to answer your question, you were talking about 1980s to 90s, that that gap and what the cumulative evolution was. And it, coming out of the 80s, there were a lot of major painters who were commanding decent amount of money for their paintings, but they were starting to do prints, more printmaking. And a lot of the print, what, pe people were buying a lot of prints based on what they could afford, but more so than ever. There were also people who were buying paintings and collages and sculptures. But because the 1980s, there was such a, influx of, of, of money in this country, a lot of people were buying um, African-American art, but not in the way that they are now, but more than before the 70s and the 80s. Going into the 90s, you, as I said, you had a lot of people with disposable income, but there were more exhibitions, there were, there, um, uh, the, the, um, there were more private art salons in people's homes. You know, there were, um, there were a lot of um, articles that were being written. There were a lot more catalogs in the 1980s through the 1990s of different exhibitions. That was a huge leap. Um, and that's why when my book came out um, in 1998, it was, it, the impact that it had was different from all of the different catalogs because here you have a publication that's saying, um, the same thing like what David Driscoll was saying, you know, not only have we, do we have a, hi we've, a history, we've been here for 200 years, and I was building on that saying, hey, not only do we have a history, but this is valuable, these are valuable um, works of art, and you should collect them. This is collectible history. This is, you know, mater historical materialism that you should acquire. And you know, going, but what led to that was the, the movement in the gallery during the 1990s. There was a lot of educating that was happening that led up to the mid 90s up to the end of the nine, you know, to the end of the century. But there were a lot of people involved. You know, there were a lot of exhibitions. There were a lot of articles. Um, more people were buying art um, and educating themselves. But I, you know, the 90s were, you know, um, leading up to the beginning of the National Black Fine Art Show in 1997. From 1997 to 2008, Jocelyn Wainwright's National Black Fine Art Show was the epicenter for the marketplace for African American artists. It was the epicenter. And he was a visionary and he saw it. He saw it. He saw it was coming. Just as Peg saw it as she was quoted in the article in the 1970s. You know, um, and in the 80s, you know, we saw it because it's the last vestige of American art that's been untapped, and that's what's happening. Good evening. I want to say thank you very much again for coming. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. I'm one of the artists that are in the show as well. Thank you very much. I enjoyed your statements about creating art that means something to you, and when you see art, what it means to you is why you want to purchase it. That's absolutely true for me as well. But I'm just wondering, how do artists get our clear vision out there for curators and for galleries to take a look at and become and be able to see our vision as artists? Yes, my piece is, my piece is behind you. Warrior Pearls as well as two other pieces. Yes, that one right there. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, I mean, you know, you take that. It's 
it's it's really <laughs> it's 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 really difficult. I mean, you know, it is you've selected a field, you know, that is hard. You know, it's only, you know, a small percentage of the artists who are going to get recognition or represented. Um, you know, what I just continue to paint, continue to create and uh, evolve and show your work uh, wherever you can to galleries, etc. Um, that's the that's how it is. It's, it's, you've chosen a difficult field. It's just for dancers too, not all, you know, it's just a fraction of dancers that, that, that make it. But uh, do work on something that is uniquely yours. I mean, you know, like, if this is your style, I would like to see that style throughout your work. It's okay to move to another level and to change a little bit, but uh, like when I was showing Stanley Whitney, he had spherical shapes rather than the squares that he's known for now. But um, there was, you know, something you can see, some kind of a theme uh, throughout and so you know bless you I wish you the best but you know I, I would like to see if this is your style I'd like to say oh if I see something else oh that's by the same artist that's when you get the attention of, uh, of, of dealers you know I mean I have artists that I'm showing now who have not gotten recognition uh, but I believe in them and I continue to show them in addition to that wise advice um, I want to encourage all artists to go and to the Clark Hudling Foundation online they have a very special um, program that I think takes place over several months or a year you have to apply to participate in it and it is specifically to help artists to develop a business sensibility that you um, not it's a it's a it's a it's a business sensibility about how to talk about your work you know having if you meet a curator you may have three seconds to say something to them what is your elevator pitch about your work um, that's to answer your question about curators um, but you know, like you know, you like Peg says, you know, you, you have to. It's a difficult field. Um, but I know that artists make art for themselves and strangers, um, fundamentally. And at the same time, you have to continue to do your work and and develop develop yourself. But in terms of being able to get in touch with people who are decision makers that can help promote the work, there are different strategies. That and, and, and steps that you can take to at least be prepared when that moment happens, is what I'm trying to say. So make sure that you, you can articulate very quickly what your work is about, what the style is, to invite a curator. Or, you know, if you go to openings and you're meeting people and talking to people, you know, you just don't go up to a curator, by the way, <laughs> or go right up to an art dealer and say, hi, I want to show you my portfolio. And, you know, you, you know, it's, it's not, or don't go to your friend's exhibition at a gallery and start selling yourself at your friend's ex opening. I mean, that's really awful. People do it, but it's awful. Um, <laughs> but there are different strategies like any other, you know, now there's the art of business and the business of art. That's always existed. Andy Warhol started that whole concept, right? And, but now more than ever, especially as black artists, you really need to understand more about the business of, of, of art so that you can be aware. Um, but, in, but in terms of your aesthetic development and the quality of your work, that's the bottom line for dealers that are going to pick, who are going to invest time and, 
and support you as well as, as, uh, as um, collectors. But the Clark Hudling um, Foundation is a really good resource. And now more than ever, there are so many, so many publications. You should also get um, a book by an attorney, by, his name is Tad Crawford. And Tad Crawford has ready-made contracts for any situation for visual artists that you can use as a template, you know, for consignments, um, you know, licensing, copyright, things of that nature. And, um, you, know, there, you know, there are a lot more resources that will help you understand other aspects. Because once somebody buys your work, it has become a commodity. But I don't want to encourage you to focus on just the business of it. I'm just saying you have to be aware. You really need to just be in the studio. Because that's really what it comes down to. Do you have two or three shows worth of work in your studio? Or are you spending most of your time networking and trying to get a show? Because that's what's happening at these art schools. I've you know, done some talks at some of the art schools. And the artists are saying, well, who can I meet? And could you introduce me to this one? And could you introduce me to that one? I'm like, OK, um, what's happening in the studio? Oh, well, I want to get a show first, and then I'm going to do the work. I never heard of this nonsense before. <laughs> this is crazy. But this is, this is you know, Instagram culture. This is, this is 21st century. You know, this is crazy. It's about the work. No matter what you're doing, it's about the work. Because the more you do your work, the more you'll get a rhythm, the more you will discover new things, the more you will grow. You know, you won't stagnate if you stay in the studio. You will stagnate if you start listening to what other people are saying. Well, what do you think about this evening? We appreciate your time, your knowledge, and your insight. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I feel like I learned so much. It was a really rich discussion. And yes, we are very fortunate to have you both here. And I'm sure everyone who was in attendance feels that way, too. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for coming and coming out tonight. And to all of you virtually, Go to Art on the App, NYC. Thank you.